6. Time and Apostolic Succession If in any sense we depart from the absolute priority of and predestination by the triune God, to that degree we begin to assert the priority of time and determination from within time. Our doctrine of justification will be similarly altered. We will then assert historical rather than theological justification. All things will be brought then to the bar of history. Either time becomes the final judge of all events, or else some values located within time are used to assess events within time. Legitimacy is therefore derived not from beyond history, from God, but from within history, from time. The results, in some fashion, is a doctrine of apostolic succession. It should not surprise us that the early church did develop such a doctrine. The Greco-Roman culture into which Christianity moved stressed the primacy of time and history. Legitimacy was derived from the continuity of time and history, not from beyond time. In fact, the legitimacy of the gods, who were divinized heroes, came from within time. The heroes of Greece became gods after their death, and the emperors of Rome could be divinized after death by the Roman Senate. Before death, they manifested the incarnate divinity of the Roman Empire in their office. The surprising fact about the doctrine of apostolic succession was that it was relatively slow in developing, as Bruce Shelley has shown. Very simply stated, a humanistic apostolic succession holds that the validity of the office of bishop or any other office depends on an historical transmission rather than the faith held. As J. Wilhelm defined it, the principle underlying the Roman claim is contained in the idea of succession. Quote, to succeed, end quote, is to be the successor of, or to occupy an official position just after, as Victoria succeeded William IV. Now the Roman pontiffs come immediately after, occupy the position, and perform the functions of St. Peter. They are, therefore, his successors. The question, therefore, for those who affirm the succession is to find it in history. For Roman Catholic conservatives who hold to that succession, this means that to break with the Pope is to break with the faith, since it resides in that apostolic succession and the authority thereof. Such a faith is a logical outcome of the Hellenic and Roman views of authority, and those who criticise Rome are often most eloquent in developing and defending a like concept of authority with respect to the state. Hitler was thus the legitimate head of the German state and to be obeyed. The British, quote, constitution, end quote, is the criterion of legitimacy, and the US constitution must be used by liberals and conservatives alike as a basis of all legitimate action. It is important, therefore, to understand the relationship of time to value, of time to standards, in order to assess judgments within history. There are, in the main, three ways in which we can assess the relationship of values to time and history. Our idea of apostolic succession will be determined thereby. First, we can affirm the reality of time only and deny God and eternity. All value is derived from history, and legality and validity depend on purely temporal factors. Thus, a well-to-do liberal became very angry with me and refused to speak further with me, when I undercut his argument with respect to American Indians. They had been robbed of the American continents he held, and restitution should be made to them. I suggested that he begin by making his own private restitution, if he believed this were the case. Also, 
Besides the, quote, technical, end quote, Indians on reservations and federal rules, there were millions of, quote, white, end quote, Americans with Indian blood, because more Indians had been absorbed into American life than there remained on reservations. How were these to be located, and restitution made to them? Moreover, existing Indians were not those who had been robbed. Why restitution to them by men, other citizens, who did no robbing? Also, the American Indians replaced and killed off earlier inhabitants. Nevada Indians remember in their stories, and the evidence confirms, that the earlier natives were a pygmy people whom the Indians massacred and eliminated from existence. How shall we require the Indians to make restitution to these earlier peoples? And what if these earlier peoples replaced some still earlier? In brief, justification from within history leads to absurdity. The claims of no people can stand and no man's property, nor any country's realm, is then valid. The Franks replaced the Gaels in France. The Visigoths took over Spain. The Anglo-Saxons and Danes, England, and so on and on. Attempts to derive legitimacy from history are futile. True, the Arabs had Palestine for centuries before the modern Israeli, but they themselves were not the original people. Moreover, the Arabs in Egypt are invaders who seized the land from the real Egyptians or Copts, a Christian people whom they still oppress. Shall Israel vacate Palestine, the Arabs Egypt, North Africa and other areas? Attempts at historical justification lead to nonsense. Values are not derived from history nor from, quotes, apostolic, end quotes, or historical succession. Historical succession is, however, basic to modern thought. It is, in fact, essential to Charles Darwin's arguments. First, Darwin arranged all living things in a lower to higher order and posited a time sequence, that is, that the lower preceded the higher in time. This was an arbitrary decision, a philosophical premise, not verifiable science. Second, because, by definition, this apostolic succession of evolution had never been broken. The future of evolution was secure and would see progress towards perfection. In Darwin's own words, in the next-to-last paragraph of The Origin of Species, we can so far take a prophetic glance into futurity as to foretell that it will be the common and widely spread species, belonging to the larger and dominant groups within each class, which will ultimately prevail and procreate new and dominant species. As all the living forms of life are the lineal descendants of those which lived long before the Cambrian epoch, we may feel certain that the ordinary succession by generation has never once been broken and that no cataclysm has desolated the whole world. Hence, we may look with some confidence to a secure future of great length. And, as natural selection works solely by and for the good of each being, all corporeal and mental endowments will tend to progress towards perfection. Without accepting the Roman Catholic doctrine, we must admit that it does give us fragmentary evidence, whereas Darwin gives us none. Darwin simply offers a blind faith that what he affirms is true, because his doctrine of time makes it possible. Potentiality and value for Darwin reside within time. The fallacy of this position is that every effort to find value and justification from within time lead to disillusionment. With the case of the Indians, we can have endless regress and come up with nothing as a value, and the same is true of other cases. Something more than time must provide the value. The second answer, thus, 
still denies the sovereign and ontological trinity, but divides time into two areas, the material realm of history and the realm of ideas, where the soul of history, quote, exists, end quote. From Plotinus to Karl Barth, we have then a realm of supra-history, which provides a limiting concept to prevent history from concluding into anarchy. Thus, for Barth, the biblical miracles and revelation are very important in order to establish the validity of knowledge and of values, but they are not history in the temporal sense. Barth wrote, At the beginning of the life of Jesus stands the miraculous token of his virgin birth. At the end of his life stands the miraculous token of the empty tomb. It is precisely to these two miracles that we have to give particular attention. We may, if we will, call the biblical reports of them legends. But let us at least see and understand their meaning as tokens. Then we shall no longer discard them as legends, nor shall we be offended by their character as unequivocally miraculous stories, because we shall realise that no stories that were not miraculous could suffice to indicate that to which they point. Bart's purpose is to rescue time and history, not to glorify and know God. The facts of history, where that history is God's revelation, are not important to Bart. In fact, they are merely tokens of the meaning of the non-theological history he is trying to validate. Because the autonomous self must be wholly free from God, and because, after Kant, history and time are taken into the consciousness of autonomous man, quote, revealed history, end quote, cannot be historical, because it would then deny the autonomy of man and his time. Thus, in speaking of the entombment and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Barthes is indifferent to its historicity in any traditional sense. He wrote, This tomb may prove to be a definitely closed or open tomb. It is really a matter of indifference. What avails the tomb proved to be this or that at Jerusalem in the year AD 30. Time and place are a matter of perfect indifference. Of what these eyes see, it can really be equally said that it was, is, and will be, never and nowhere as that it was, is, and will be, always, everywhere possible. Until has pinpointed the implication of Bart's view very tellingly. Indeed, a fact of history is, according to Bart, not genuinely such unless it is everywhere and always possible. It is this sort of fact that is everywhere and always happening. That is to say, the resurrection of Christ stands, in his case, for the idea of the general progress of the human race toward ideal perfection. For part, Christ has a very real place in faith, but not in history. Christ, quote, lives, end quote, in the realm of faith as a guarantor of the value of time. Myths are a necessity in this perspective as the means of ensuring the reality and value of time. Of course, man does not live long by illusion, and the world of Karl Barth is a world of increasingly empty churches, cynical and pessimistic men, and increasingly amoral social and historical action. Men are religiously bankrupt, and time has no meaning for them. The comment of one university dropout and, quote, struggling artist, end quote, is symptomatic. The meaning is death. Time, devoid of meaning, means life, devoid of meaning. These two approaches to time both find it difficult to find meaning in time. Just as in the area of epistemology, problems also overwhelm them. 
knowledge and meaning, as well as values, escape all who seek an answer out of the context of time. Their various versions of apostolic succession become empty and rotting staircases, leading from nowhere to nowhere. For the third approach, time, meaning, history, knowledge and values, are not problems at all. The given, the presupposition, being the ontological and triune God of Scripture, all things are comprehended within God's decree and creation. The problem, then, is not time, meaning knowledge or values, but sin. Man's problem is that, as sinner, he tries to conceal his problem, his rebellion against God and his covenant. Man seeks freedom from God by declaring himself to be his own God, autonomous and independent from God. Instead, man creates a world of total problems. Wherever man turns, he faces insoluble problems, and death itself has his only alternative to the problem of sin. Meanwhile, of course, man's problem of sin does not disappear simply because man chooses to deny it any more than the world vanishes whenever we shut our eyes to it. Man remains a sinner, guilty before God. Redeemed man, however, being restored to the creation mandate to exercise dominion and to subdue the earth, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28, finds time to be an area of total meaning and value because he believes in the totally sovereign God. Not one atom of the universe exists apart from God and his purpose. The universe and time are realms of total meaning because out of him came forth the corner, out of him the nail, out of him the battle bow, out of him every oppressor together. Zechariah chapter 10 verse 4 As St. Paul summarizes it, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 Philosophies and faiths which have problems with time, meaning and knowledge are, by that fact, confessing their moral rebellion and failure. They are engaged in what criminal law knows as plea bargaining. They are pleading in terms of a lesser offence in order to avoid the real charges against them. I cited earlier an argument with a man over, quote, justice, end quote, to the American Indians. I have had, in recent years, numerous similar arguments, in person and by mail. A passing reference to, quote, Indian rights, end quote, in a Calcedon report, brought me a flood of angry mail, almost all of it from people not on the mailing list, but readers of other people's copies. Such people are ready to bleed for any and every cause as a means of establishing their self-righteousness. They have no interest in Indians in the flesh. In all these cases, when I cite the doctrine of historical succession to them and ask whom shall we regard as the offended party, they are irate. It does not occur to them to raise the question of historical legitimacy, so let us raise it here and now. In any form of apostolic succession, Historical validity or justification is to be ruled out. Then have we not established a doctrine of the legitimacy of revolution? Specifically, if the legal succession of federal presidents and congresses does not establish in itself the validity of the United States government, then have we not made revolution clearly and plainly legitimate? If we rule out the idea of, quote, apostolic, end quote, succession in some form, do we not ensure anarchy and revolution? The answer is emphatically no. By denying justification to history and historical succession, we do not invalidate time, but rather establish it under God's decree and law. 
We cannot absolutize time and history, nor can we establish their meaning and value from within their own context. God is the source of all meaning, and his word is a law of all creation. Legitimacy is not removed from the world, but rather established therein. To be specific, the legitimacy of the United States, Great Britain, or any other civil order is not in its apostolic succession legal heads, parliaments, or congresses, but in its conformity to the law of God. However, the illegitimacy of any civil order in relation to the law of God does not justify revolution, and obedience is rather commanded. Romans chapter 13 verses 1 to 10, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 13 and 14. To assert revolution as a means to legitimacy is to declare that it is man's word and act that constitute the ground of legitimacy. Rather, it is the regenerating power of God and man's obedience to the law of God which establish meaning and legitimacy in history. Where that regeneration and the obedience of faith are operative, there too legitimacy exists, and the historical succession becomes confirmed and blessed. Thus, the Davidic dynasty in Judea did not prevent God from condemning and destroying the monarchy as apostate, immoral, and illegitimate in his sight. The criterion he required was the, quote, succession, end quote, of faith, not simply historical, but supernatural, and hence historical. The historical succession, as such, is meaningless, because history and time do not determine meaning, but are the arena in which God manifests his meaning. Attempts, therefore, to derive an historical or, quote, apostolic, end quote, succession as the means to historical justification are thus invalid. They do not establish historical meaning, but rather undercut it. In that they seek justification and value from history, rather than the word of God. This is the key. Is justification sought simply in an historical succession? History does not establish validity.